Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. The concept of sterilizing individuals that are deemed undesirable seems like something that wouldn't happen in Canada. And while it is not something incredibly recent in our history, it has happened in Canada and was not a brief piece of legislation that disappeared quickly. In fact, it lasted for almost half a century. It was also supported by figures that are applauded today but for different reasons. I'm talking about the Alberta Eugenics Board, a dark chapter in the history of the province. Now by the 1920s, talk of eugenics against people deemed to be mentally disabled or unfit was gaining traction within the United States. The first sterilization law would emerge in 1907 in the United States, and in 1910, the American Breeders Association established a eugenics section. That eugenics interest would make its way to Canada, especially into Alberta and British Columbia. With some legislation passing in the United States, Alberta would emerge as the province most in favor of such legislation itself. Throughout this episode, I will use some terms such as feeble-minded that are not used today as quotes or wording in legislation. One term that is going to pop up a lot is eugenics, which means well-born. Now in 1918, the Canadian National Committee of Mental Hygiene would be established to, in its words, fight crime, prostitution, and unemployment which the committee organizers believed was related directly to a person's intelligence. One year later, Dr. C.K. Clark would conduct several provincial surveys of mental institutions and would make a report in 1921 that would recommend policies for provincial governments. The report would state that social inefficiency and corruption were tied to mental inadequacy, and in order to prevent such issues, sterilization was the right course of action. In 1922, the United Farmers of Alberta, which was the government in charge of Alberta at the time, would take these recommendations and pledge to draft and implement legislation that would segregate those deemed to be mentally handicapped, and a recommendation of sterilization was also put forward. The government felt that the act would help to alleviate, in their words, the growing burden of taxpayers in caring for immigrants and mentally disabled persons. Through heavy lobbying by the United Farm Women of Alberta, the United Farmers of Alberta government would get that legislation passed. The terrible attitude of this legislation was seen in 1924 when Margaret Gunn, the president of the United Farm Women, stated that democracy was never intended for degenerates. And the organization also stated that by creating genetically superior children, there was hope for a future utopian society. Several prominent Canadians supported a form of eugenics, including J.S. Woodsworth, who was a social activist and first leader of the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, which would become the federal NDP in later years, as well as Robert Wallace, the future president of the University of Alberta, and four members of the famous five who spearheaded the person's case and campaigned for women's rights. These four women were Nellie McClung, Irene Parlby, Louise McKinney, and Emily Murphy. William Aberhart, also known as Bible Bill and the future Premier of Alberta, was also a supporter of eugenics policies. McClung, for her part, would state that women were the mothers and guardians of their race, and she would champion things such as sterilization, which she felt would deal with the problems of prostitution and alcohol. McClung would state, and this is in her words, which uses a word that is out of favor today, In regards to sterilization revitalizing an entire family, she said that now, the father is no longer worried about his retarded daughter's promiscuity. Now peace was restored. Emily Murphy saw sterilization as the answer to dealing with what she perceived as evils, such as manipulation, promiscuity, and single motherhood. In 1932, she would publish an article called Overpopulation and Birth Control, which stated that eugenics would be a means for peace. She also wrote about the issues of Chinese immigration, calling it the Yellow Peril in the Black Candle in 1922, writing as Janie Canuck. In 
she took the view that inferior people created more inferior people, and that those people were inclined to be criminals. Even Alexander Graham Bell supported eugenics, and in 1921 at the American Museum of Natural History, an International Eugenics Congress was held, and he served as the honorary president. It should be noted that Tommy Douglas, the father of Medicare, and the man considered to be the greatest Canadian in history, also toyed with the idea of eugenics. He would write his thesis paper at McMaster University on the concept of eugenic policies, including, as he would say, the sterilization of mental defectives. Now that being said, by the time he was Premier of Saskatchewan, he had rejected sterilization and abandoned his support of it. He chose to go about providing therapy and vocational training for those with mental illnesses and intellectual disabilities. In order to make the concept of eugenics and sterilization easier for the public to get behind, the government put forward the rationale that families with mentally handicapped offspring were a financial burden on the province. So, on March 25, 1927, the Sexual Sterilization Bill was introduced by George Hadley, the Minister of Agriculture. It would fail, but on March 21, 1928, it was introduced again as the Sexual Sterilization Act and it would pass, becoming law for the next 43 years. British Columbia would follow with its own Sexual Sterilization Act in 1933. Now the reason I am focusing on Alberta is because British Columbia, while having the act in place until 1973, only sterilized 200 to 400 people. Alberta did four times that many in just the first few years of having the act in place. On June 1, 1927, the United Farmers Association would publish an article about the issue with, as they called it, mentally defective individuals. In the article, three groups of feeble-minded were identified. The terms they used are ones we use in a much different context now as well. I'm going to quote the piece by the UFA directly, rather than read it as a historical fact. I feel it is important to quote a lot of this piece because it shows the mentality of the government that would pass the Sexual Sterilization Act. First, they identified the lowest grade in their view, stating the following. The feeble-minded are divided into three groups, the lowest being that of the idiot. These children never advance beyond a three-year-old mentality. There is no danger to the community from this type of feeble-minded persons, as they are incapable of reproducing their kind. Second, they identified the next grade in their view, stating the following. The next grade is that of the imbeciles, who have a mental level of from 3 to 7 years. As children of this type are generally physically defective as well as mentally, they are easily recognized. Lastly, the most dangerous class in their view, as they state. The class most dangerous to society is that of the morons, with a 7 to 12 year old mentality. These children, while having normal instincts and emotions, have little judgment and reasoning power, and so their passions have a much freer reign. Hence, we may find many a juvenile court case at 10 or 12 years of age, and find these children in rescue homes, prisons, pauper institutions, and reformatories. They are often found in very bad company, being a pawn of the criminals, climbing in windows of a housebreaker, and stealing from stores. Now the piece goes on to state that the increase can be prevented, quoting Dr. Goddard, that, in their words, the birth rate among the feeble-minded is from two to six times as great as among normals. Surely now it is time to bring about measures to check this menace before it becomes too great. We cannot segregate the feeble-minded because of the enormous expense this would entail. Now at first, the Alberta law stipulated that sterilization could only happen with the consent of the patient, their guardian, or next of kin. The provision would last for less than a decade, before the Sexual Sterilization Act was amended to allow for the sterilization without consent. As part of the legislation, a four-member Alberta Eugenics Board would be formed to recommend individuals for sterilization. The first four members of the board would be Dr. J. M. McKeeran, who is a professor at the University of Alberta and would serve as its chair, a position he would hold for 40 years. Gene Field, the health convener of the United Farm Women of Alberta was also on the board and would serve from 1929 to 1937, from 1938 to 1945, 
and from 1947 to 1949. Dr. Edgerton Pope would serve on the board from 1929 to 1949 and was the Department Head of Medicine and Director of Medical Services at the University of Alberta Hospital. The last original member would be Dr. E.G. Mason, a veteran of the First World War who had served on the Visitors Board of the Provincial Government's Committee to inspect health care in the province, and he would serve on the board until 1947. The board involved superintendents of Alberta mental institutions presenting cases to the board. They also presented summaries for each individual, which included sexual history, family history, medical history, education, IQ testing, criminal record, ethnic background, religion, and age. Patients would be interviewed by the board as well, and then recommendations would be made for sterilization. A surgeon would then be appointed for a case but the act prevented the surgeon from being liable to any civil action. Patients typically came from four hospitals, termed feeder hospitals. They were the Alberta Hospital in Pinoca, the Provincial Training School in Red Deer, the Alberta Hospital in Oliver, and Deer Home in Red Deer. At first, the board would take about an hour to review each case, but by the mid-1930s, some cases were reviewed in less than five minutes. Often, as many as 13 cases would be reviewed in just one hour. And over the course of the 43 years of existence, the board had a total of 19 members. Ken Nelson speaks about his experience he had in front of the board. Yeah, but I didn't know what, what it was. That, I just wondered and he asked me a bunch of questions. And I can't even remember if they mentioned sterilization or not. He said I had the highest IQ in the institution. Did they tell you you were getting sterilized? No. Do you remember what they said when they they sent you for the procedure? Yeah, we were going over to the clinical building. When did you find out that you'd been sterilized? A week later. I I made a bet with us with one of the staff. He told me he knew where I was going to be for the weekend. And I bet him my, I bet him we didn't know. So he told me finally, because he was going to be there with us. Leilani Muir, someone whose name will come up a few times, speaks about her experience. The eugenics board had to give approval. Five minutes in their office and we were out of there. It took five minutes for them to decide to wreck our lives and I don't even know why they met with us because they already had their minds made up it was already stamped and cleared we were human beings we weren't cattle like they were literally just like on a conveyor belt throwing us through they had their own medical building which was built the same year I was put in there in 55 Um, It was called the Medical Clinic, and they did it right there on the grounds at the PTS. Other people went to Pinoca and had it done. Glenn Sinclair was also put before the board before he was sterilized, and he relates his experience. I thought at the time, of course we all did, and we didn't ask questions when I was in the institution. I thought it was that, that we were having your appendix out. And so I didn't really, you know, being that age, you, you never ask these questions or anything because the staff would would tell you it's none of your business sort of thing, you know, and wouldn't tell you what what for, why, why you have this operation. I was marched up to the um, main building, and they had a board there, something like this, table there and a few people there asking questions about me and, and to me of course just to see what kind of a person I am and what I say and um, I think it was about five minute discussion. At the time support for sterilization was high throughout many areas of Canada. In 1930 the Canadian Medical Association Journal would publish an article called Sterilization for Human Betterment, stating that, 
Persons should be sterilized if it is in the interest of the race that they produce no children or no more children, and if it appears that sterilization is the most effective and satisfactory means of preventing reproduction. Several changes to the Act would come, including the already mentioned amendment to remove the need for consent. Now this was done in 1937, by which point 400 operations had been done. This amendment actually was done by a new government, the Social Credit Party led by William Aberhart, which had just come to power. Dr. W. W. Cross, the new Minister of Health, felt that only a few hundred individuals were sterilized when thousands could have been done without consent. Dr. Charles Baragar, the Director of Mental Health for the province, would highlight this thought, stating, The Sexual Sterilization Act is a very mild one. On account of the necessity for securing consent in all cases, there are a number of cases in which sexual sterilization would be strongly advised, to whose consent cannot be obtained. Newspapers in the province, including the Edmonton Bulletin, agreed with this sentiment. This year was also the same year that Nazi Germany began sterilizing children who were seen as not pure Aryans. Once the amendments passed, anyone regarded as a mental defective was eligible without consent. One month later, the board began to look at past cases of individuals who were now eligible as well. In this same year, Alberta would enact a new law that dealt with the possessions of those deemed mentally incompetent. Titled, an act representing the mentally incompetent persons in their estates, it would outline when the Alberta government could take possession of the estates of persons they deemed mentally incompetent. If a person was declared unsound in mind, the court could appoint a committee to take possession of their property and assets. The legislation stated that the court could manage the estate for the maintenance for benefit of the individual, which allowed the court to use the estate for whatever they saw fit. An example of this is if an individual ran a business. If the court deemed them mentally unsound, the committee could run that business any way they liked. Now while this does not deal with sexual sterilization, it did show that the government was taking a deeper role in controlling the lives of those they deemed mentally handicapped. Another amendment was put into the Act in 1942 to include individuals with syphilis and epilepsy, or who were addicted to alcohol or drugs. In these cases, consent was still needed. One of the more interesting aspects of Alberta at this time was that most places in the United States were abandoning their eugenics movements, while Alberta was enacting more legislation. As for why this was happening, several ideas have been put forward by historians. One was that the province was seeing a huge influx of immigrants, resulting in the arrival of people that some felt were inferior stock. Beginning in 1890, there was a steady increase of immigrants into the Alberta area. In 1890, the future province had a population of 98,173, and that increased to 374,295 people by 1911. This led to some fear that the native-born stocks of Canadians were being outnumbered by foreign-born individuals. It was also believed that the racially inferior, the poor, and the mentally inferior had higher birth rates compared to Anglo-Canadians. By allowing immigrants into the country, some believed it was hurting the Caucasians of the country, and one eugenic supporter called it race suicide. Another theory is that most people were unaware of the sterilization laws, but that may not be the case as it was widely reported and often supported in major Alberta newspapers. Another reason could be that there was a low Catholic church presence in Alberta, which was made up of mostly Protestants and other denominations. Within Canada, the Catholic church was heavily against the use of eugenics. Following 1940, women would be the likely target for sterilization. While women comprise less than 40% of the patients in institutions, 64% of the cases involved women ended in sterilization, compared to 54% for men. Likewise, young adults and youths made up 20% of the population, but were 44% of the presented cases and 55% of the sterilization cases. Their numbers would increase as well. In the 1930s, 
21% of those who had their cases go to the board were under the age of 19. By the 1960s, that percentage had risen to 61%. Minorities were also targeted by the board. Over the course of 40 years, Indigenous people made up 6% of all sterilization cases, despite only making up 2% of the population. In addition, 74% of the Indigenous cases presented to the board ended in sterilization. When it was finally repealed in 1972 by Peter Lougheed and the Progressive Conservatives, the Sexual Sterilization Act had been responsible for the approval of 5,000 sterilization cases, of which 2,832 sterilizations were actually conducted. The average reviewing time for each case was found to be 11 to 18 minutes. Roughly 89% of all cases did not require consent. During its history, there were two peaks for sterilization. The first was in the mid-1930s, when there is as many as 200 sterilizations per year, with the second peak in the late 1950s. We go back to Leilani Muir, who talks about her sterilization experience. They told me they were taking my appendix out. Well, I never asked questions. I, I Back then, I just did everything I was told. I never, ever asked anybody questions. I was about 20, close to 24, I believe it was. Um, I went to the U of A hospital, and I saw a Dr. Goodwin there. And I told him I wanted to have children, and I was having trouble, eh? And, of course, they have to ask questions, and, you know, and they asked me what the scar was on my stomach. And he says, they don't remove your appendix from the stomach. I said, well, that's funny. They told me they did. And they did a test where they put the dye through your, to check all for the alpha tubing and stuff. And there was no tube there. There was about a quarter of an inch of one tube on the left side. The act was repealed, citing three reasons. First, it violated fundamental human rights. It was based on medical and genetic theories that were not scientifically valid, and because there were legal issues with it, including making surgeons exempt from civil liability. Premier Peter Lougheed, speaking to the legislature about repealing of the act, would say, We feel very strongly that the act is offensive and at odds with the proposed Bill of Rights. MLA David King would be the one to put forward the bill, and he would state during his second reading, I come finally to the last reason, which, for me personally, is the most compelling. That is simply that the act violates fundamental human rights. We are provided with an act, the basis of which is a presumption that society, or at least the government, knows what kind of people can be allowed children and what kinds of people cannot. It is our view that this is a reprehensible and intolerable philosophy and program for this province and this government. In 1975, the University of Alberta would create an annual lecture series to honour Dr. McKeeran. This would continue until September 3, 1997, when the lectures were renamed because of his association with sterilization. In 1995, Leilani Muir would launch a lawsuit against the provincial government over her wrongful sterilization. She would say she was given an IQ test at the provincial training school, with the result being 64. Anyone below 70 was considered to be degraded intelligence, and the board would order her sterilized. As we heard, she was told she was getting her appendix removed, but the January 19, 1959 surgery actually had the purpose of destroying her fallopian tubes. In 1989, she would take another IQ test, where she had a score of 89. Dr. George Kerbatov stated that she did not have a mental defect now, that she was living in a better environment. Soon after, she sought legal counsel, and on January 25, 1996, Muir was awarded $740,000 in damages 
at $230,000 in legal costs. In her decision, Honorable Madame Joanne Viet would state, In 1959, the province wrongfully surgically sterilized Miss Muir. The particular type of confinement of which Miss Muir was a victim in many travesties to her young person. Loss of liberty, loss of reputation, humiliation, and disgrace. Pain and suffering, loss of enjoyment of life, loss of normal development experiences, loss of civil rights, loss of contact with family and friends, and subjection to institution discipline. Following the case, the Alberta government formally apologized for the sterilization of 2,832 people and 850 Albertans who were sterilized were awarded $145 million in damages. Muir would spend the rest of her life living in Devon, Alberta with her pets, and she would write a book about her experience. She would pass away on March 14, 2016. Before I end... I should highlight that Alberta was not alone in its sterilization laws in the Western world, even if it was the most prolific with them in Canada. In the United States between 1907 and 1937, 32 states enacted sterilization laws. From 1907 to the 1970s, when most of the laws were repealed, 60,000 Americans were sterilized, which included 20,000 in California alone. In 1938, Iceland passed a sterilization law which lasted until the 1970s. Norway would sanction sterilization on eugenic and social grounds in 1934, and while it was a voluntary procedure, many were pressured into it. Between 1940 and 1942, 101 individuals were sterilized a year. From 1943 to 1945, during Nazi occupation, 209 sterilizations a year were conducted. Sweden passed a sterilization law in 1935, which lasted until 1976 and saw 63,000 people sterilized. In Finland, 1,460 sterilizations took place between 1935 and 1970, officially, but many believe the number could be as high as 11,000. And under Nazi Germany, it is estimated that as many as 400,000 people were sterilized during the 1930s and the 1940s. Information comes from the Canadian Encyclopedia, CBC, Wikipedia, the eugenicsarchive.ca, the history of rights.ca, McGill Daily, the Alberta Eugenics Movement and the 1937 Amendment to the Sexual Sterilization Act, acresofsnow.ca, the coming and goings of eugenics in Alberta, and BC Campus. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Canadian History X, and if you did, please give a rating and review. You can support the podcast by going to Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. You can email me any questions you have at craig at canadax.ca and you can find hundreds of articles on my website at canadax.com. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.